So I have the easiest job of anybody at Slush today. The easiest job. The reason is I'm trying to engage you guys in a sector that you're already inspired by. About 20 minutes ago backstage, I was talking to a couple of my fellow founders. One of them wanted to be an astronaut as a kid, and the other one had a father who had books on astronomy all over the place. So I know that many people here are already interested in space, so all I'm going to do is get you to think about what you do right now in your lives and uh, apply it to a sector that is growing at an exponential rate. First things first, this image is not real. I can't tell you how many people ask me about Singaporeans having already gone to Mars. That's just me with Photoshop, right? But this image could represent the future, and I think it should. I'm going to introduce you to a couple terms today that you may not have heard before. The first is astropreneurship. So it's entrepreneurship, but in the space sector, so I call it astropreneurship. Um, and then the other word that I've actually come up with is um, big space. What I want to do is give you a history of the way space tech has been done, um, the way it's being done now, and what your role is going to be in it. So I see you guys as the rocket scientists of the future, and by the end of this talk, I think you'll believe me and you're going to be on board. So my first job out of college was on the Hubble Space Telescope. I worked as a calibration engineer, and my job was actually to monitor instrument performance as it degraded over time. The reason it degraded was the Hubble was actually mothballed, stuck into a clean room, because the Challenger um, space shuttle actually had exploded. And as you might recall, well, for many of you, this is before you were born, um, the Challenger was a space shuttle that took up some civilians as well as astronauts, and it tragically exploded and everybody on board died. And so the whole program was put on the shelf by NASA for a number of years. And what that meant was the Hubble was supposed to go up and we had to wait. And my job would be to look at the data every few months when we turned it on to see what was working and to see what was not. So it was a huge risk at the time, right? I mean, I remember my professor saying to me, if it doesn't work, don't worry. You can move back home with your parents. And I'm like, yeah, thanks for recommending me for a job where I can move back home with my parents. But the thing is, the Hubble have ended up giving us images that are just incredible. So what you see behind me is a very famous image of an area which in your left-hand side is a dust cloud. And when you use special instrumentation from the Hubble, you see stars that humanity has never seen before. Never seen before. And now we think of the Hubble and people are like, oh my god, that's so cool. I mean, my parents didn't even want me to work on the Hubble. They would have preferred I go to medical school, which I think many Indian parents do. But the point is, people thought of something as very risky and then came around. And I see this as something that's very similar to the journey we are going on here in Singapore with regard to the space tech sector. We see it as super risky. We're not really sure what the benefits are going to be. But I'm telling you, down the road, we're going to have financial return. We're going to have social return. And we're going to see some amazing things come up that we haven't even thought of, things that are technology that we can't even imagine. So the Hubble. The Hubble was a, had a price tag of $2 billion, right? It's a lot of money. Let's look at some other very expensive projects. Um, NASA and ISRO, the Indian Space Agency here in Asia, for example, have sent missions to Mars. The Mars rovers, I worked on one of those projects. The typical rover was around $300 million. That's a lot of money. But then the Indians came along and decided to do this for a much more affordable price of 70 million. That still sounds like a lot, right? But that's about as much as a Hollywood movie might cost. Let's drop the price tag a little bit further with the help of Elon Musk. Now, he launches one of his SpaceX rockets for around $70 million. Now, you see here the, the rocket man in his red Tesla that was launched. How many people here know about Rocket Man and the Tesla? Pretty much everybody. So I work over at One North at a startup space, and we've got people in sectors there in startups and everything from HR to cosmetics to data, fintech, people working in all different fields. And the day that Elon launched his Tesla, people just came running up to me, telling me that they had seen this. They were so excited. And you know, he did something very revolutionary. He got people engaged. Um, I was over at Gem Mall just a few weeks ago, 
And on the escalator behind me was this mom with her teenage son talking about Mars exploration, talking about space. That never would have happened three or four years ago. People are really thinking about this as a viable option. So let me drop the price tag for you a little bit more. We've heard from a number of startups here at Slush that work in different sectors. Um, there's Astroscale that talked earlier. They're cleaning up space de debris. They've um, brought in something like 30 to 40 million in funding already. We've, had talked from, we've heard talks of rocket companies that are also putting together technology to send things into space. And I've got an example here of a company called Spire that's done more than $70 million in funding. I think they're up to their Series D right now. This satellite that they have here, this one that I have my fingers on, that's our product. That's a satellite, a desktop model that was built, designed and built here in Singapore by a Singaporean for projects that we offer for one of our products. We do workshops. So $60,000, now that's really getting affordable. That's really in a realm where you can think about shelling some money out to get something into space. We do experiments on board the International Space Station. We have students putting together experiments for $60,000 today to look at genetically modified bacteria, to look at microplating, to look at the behavior of magnetic fluids in space, processes that have real implications, so things that you can do up there that you can't do down here, a real source of potential uh, revenue for lots of different sectors. And so we've done um, five experiments to date. You can do the math, 30. 3 million, uh, 300,000, sorry, getting hopeful there. So $300,000 so far um, in two years from our startup. That's not bad for a startup in two years. And um, it's not quite enough to get me a Tesla, not yet. But you know, there is real possibility in Singapore of developing products that there's a market for. Let me give you a little bit of a sense of the enormous talent pool that we have here in Singapore. NASA does an annual hackathon, a space apps challenge. Last year, we thought we'd try this out just to kind of test the market, kind of to see who here does space, who's interested in space. And we ran the first ever NASA space apps challenge here in the country. One of our teams became a global finalist. There were 25,000 entries, 25,000 participants globally from 69 countries, six prizes globally, one of the teams was from Singapore. First time ever we entered that. So think about that. Pretty impressive, I think. The winning team was called Team Radaway, and they came up with a product that could be used on Earth to monetize, that you could take into space as well when that sector is ready. They were looking at a radiation exposure for people like pilots and flight attendants who were up in, you know, at high altitudes for extended periods of time. So you develop a tech for them, and then you take that tech and you apply it to the space sector when it's ready. So we are building for a market that's not quite there yet, but if the technology is ready, the day that they're ready, we're going to be able to address their need. Let me do some more here to convince you that there's a lot of talent here in the country. Um, some of the other ideas that we had that I think were pretty promising, these are all data analytics kind of ideas using um, currently available information from NASA. People talked about urban planning um, to optimize solar energy, a crowdsourced NASApedia, to, so to speak, monitoring aircraft um, air quality at rocket launch sites. You can also use data from satellites taking images of the Earth to do um, risk management for flooding and also to look at human migration patterns. These are all um, just done simply with the NASA data that's available. We're now imaging planet Earth once every day. Every point on the Earth imaged every single day. Think about the wealth of data that's out there. There are applications that you can come up with for everything from retail to these obvious things where we're making life better on Earth. It's just a very rapidly growing market and the talents here locally. So we did this last year with, um, with a company called Padang who does a great job with hackathons. And then we also had the support of SG Innovate. And we're doing this again in October of this year if you're interested. So space is democratized. This is real. We're launching hundreds of those handheld satellites I showed you earlier. We're launching hundreds of those um, on an annual basis. And the number is only going to go up. There are current uses for this. Um, if people are talking about using it for IoT. You put a satellite up there that serves as a relay station. There's a huge interest in providing internet to underserved rural areas in Africa and Asia, for example. 
There are companies talking about thousands of CubeSats being launched specifically for that purpose. Now, you can basically launch a satellite, I said, for $300,000. That's not much more than a car cost in this country, and that cost is only going to drop. So the data that comes down from that, the analytics of that are another possible area. Space tourism, it's a thing. Um, people like Richard Branson, Virgin Galactic are talking about sending people up there. So whenever you send regular citizens up there, not just astronauts who are in perfect condition, we're going to need services. We're going to need products and everything from medicine and psychology to space law to support that. And that's where the non-scientists and non-engineers come in. We really need everybody to work together in this sector. Asteroid mining is another thing. It's one of my favorite topics. Asteroids are worth trillions of dollars with a T. We have telescopes. We can look at asteroids. We know what they're made of. And if you look at current market value for you know, rare metals such as molybdenum, or you can look at something like iron, some of these rocks are worth trillions of dollars. Now, in terms of investments, um, the country of Luxembourg, which is similar in size to Singapore, similar high per capita GDP, they are investing heavily in asteroid mining and other areas of space tech right now, both on the government side and also on the um, commercial side. So there are two things, two points I really want to make to you guys today. The first is that it, small nations that get involved do not have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to go in and do everything that um, has to be done for the, for the full space cycle, like was being done in the old days by NASA. Um, in our example, for instance, we let SpaceX do the launches for us. Let them worry about the rocket. Let them worry about getting the payload on board, doing all that testing that has to be done to make sure that you can handle the rocket ride. There's no reason for us to do the whole supply chain. We can focus on what really interests us and specialize, and there's enormous enormous um, first adopter advantage here. The market is being developed in Singapore and in Southeast Asia. We can serve as a global hub, and you can decide what you want to work on, and your work will serve as a nucleation site for other people to come in and build upon. So that's an enormous position of power to be in right now. And the other thing I want to do, um, you may have noticed I'm not a dude. Diversity is really important to me. I have two daughters. And I have to say that uh, we all know that companies that have a more diverse workforce make more money. That's been shown. And I really want to encourage everybody here to think, regardless of your background, whether it's your professional background or personal background, that you can make um, a real difference. So is this sector going to slow down? Uh, there's a company called New Space Global. They look at industry trends and they do modeling of future e efforts. And right now we have about 1,500 startups in the space sector here on Earth. And that number is going to go up to about 10,000, they predict, by 2026. And here's the thing. That can't just be people in startups in North America and Europe. That's got to involve the 4 billion people living on this side of the planet. I mean, if Elon Musk wants to go to Mars, he can't do it by himself. He's going to need the talent, the STEM talent, the talent in every other sector that we have here on, in Asia, in APAC, to help get us to where we need to be. And again, I want to think, have you guys think about how you, can, how you can contribute. So this is my final thought for you here. This is your call to action. And I want to reach out to investors as well as to startups here, because we need both. So I think the best thing we can look at is leveraging Singapore's position as a global financial hub. We're already a hub for fintech. We do smart cities. The world looks to Singapore for expertise in all these areas. And for investors, um, I want you to seriously think about space as a viable funding option. The risks are not as high as you think. Every once in a while, I have an investor say to me, what if the rocket blows up? There's insurance for that, right? It's an entire sector. Um, so the risks are not as high as you think, and the financial returns can be enormous. I'm not just talking asteroid mining where you, you spend a few hundred million and you get trillion back. I'm talking about smaller projects where you can do services, where you can do software, and the return will come you know, fairly quickly. So if you're willing to invest in med tech, think about space tech as well. They both have long timelines and they have high return. So for astropreneurs, what I want you guys to think about is you have startups or you have startups you're thinking about, you have products. Think about those products and how you can apply those to space. If you haven't thought about it already, you can go and read a lot of stuff. There are a lot of websites out there. You can get a sense of current trends. You can think about services that you can provide. And the cool thing is you're already thinking about monetizing here on Earth. 
All you got to do is have that product ready, have it in mind for when uh, space industry needs it, especially as human presence in space increases through tourism. We're going to need all the stuff that you guys are doing here on Earth to support humanity up there. So I would encourage you to think about your startups, read a lot, and then network. Um, we run a Singapore Astropreneurs Meetup. The next meetup we have is in October. And then we also do um, sort of tutorials and workshops and hackathons, and we have those coming up in October as well. And I'm hoping to see all of you guys at any or all of these events so that we can all build the um, astropreneurship ecosystem together here in Singapore. Thanks.